The mass internment of Japanese Americans during World War II is almost universally condemned as a shameful episode in American history. But were there actually any cases of Japanese American disloyalty that could have explained their internment by the US government? To many, one shocking betrayal in the Hawaiian Islands in the aftermath of the attack on Pearl Harbor was all the justification they needed. Let's take a closer look at this incident. Okay, before I get started with the story, I just have to get this out of the way and say that I am in no way trying to defend what the American government did to Japanese Americans during World War II. To intern or discriminate against people based on their ancestry in such a way was very clearly disproportionate and it was a major violation of their human rights. I also want to say the actions of a few should in no way reflect on the vast majority of Japanese Americans who were in no way divided in their loyalties. However, at the same time, I think it does a disservice to history to ignore the inconvenient or uncomfortable truths about what happened. Just like how today we talk openly about the internment of Japanese Americans in an attempt to learn from our mistakes and not repeat them again, I think it's important, even if they were the exception rather than the rule, to look at actual cases of disloyalty in an attempt to understand what the people of the era were thinking and feeling. Okay, so with all that said, let's get into the story. The incident I'd like to cover today is now known as the Nihau Incident, named after the island of Hawaii on which it happened. Our story begins in the immediate aftermath of the attack on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Of course, this attack famously took place at Pearl Harbor on the island of Oahu, but the nearby island of Nihau was designated by the Japanese Naval Command as an extraction point for any airplanes or attack vessels that were damaged or for anyone who was injured during the attack itself. The island was considered uninhabited by the Japanese Navy because it had been owned independently and privately by the Robinson family for several generations before that. And the only people really living on the island were native Hawaiians. So they figured it was a perfect place for their downed pilots to await rescue. And this very thing happened when Airman First Class Shigenori Nishikaichi, who was in the second attack wave on Pearl Harbor, was shot down and landed on the island of Nihau to await rescue. And it just so happened that standing nearly at the exact spot where Nishikaichi crashed his plane was native Hawaiian Hawila Kaleohano. Now, Kaleohano had no idea that an attack had just taken place at Pearl Harbor, but he knew from newspapers and things of the like that the relationship between Japan and the U.S. was not perfect to say the least. Kaleohano, recognizing that the plane was Japanese, before Nishikaichi was able to wake up from his daze, acted quickly and seized his pistol and his papers from the airplane. Talk about quick thinking. Still, being Hawaiian, Kaleohano felt that it was his duty to treat the downed pilot with as much hospitality as he could. As other native Hawaiians came to the scene, they treated him very kindly and they even threw a party for him later that night. However, communication between the two parties was pretty challenging as Nishikaichi only spoke Japanese and a little bit of English. So the native Hawaiians called for a local first generation Japanese immigrant by the name of Ishimatsu Shintani, who was married to a local Hawaiian woman. The natives, while fetching Shintani, briefed him on the situation and asked if he'd be able to translate. Viewing the task with evident distaste, Shintani approached Nishikaichi, the downed pilot, exchanged a few brief words with him, and inexplicably departed. This confused the native Hawaiians, but they just threw their hands up and went, okay, well, let's look for the only two other people of Japanese descent on the entire island. These were a husband and wife by the names of Yoshio Harada, who was of Japanese ancestry, but not actually from Japan himself, and his wife Irene, who was a first-generation Japanese immigrant. While Harada was speaking with Nishikaichi, he was informed of everything that had happened at Pearl Harbor, hearing about it for the first time, but he chose not to share any of this with his neighbors, the local Hawaiians. By this point, Nishikaichi was aware of what the locals had done by taking his papers and his pistol from his aircraft, and he was desperate to get them back, as the Japanese Navy had instructed him not to let them fall into any enemy hands under any circumstances. 
Now, I can't speak to Harada and his wife's motivations or why they chose to do this, but they decided to help Nishikaichi retrieve his papers. At this point, I think it's worth pausing for a moment just to really let the implications of this sink in and to recognize the gravity of the decision that they chose to make at this moment. Almost without hesitation, they chose to side with this downed pilot over their fellow neighbors and Americans. It's worth remembering that Harada himself, the husband, was just of Japanese ancestry. He wasn't even from Japan. So the decision is a really interesting one in my opinion. But at the same time, I think it's worth recognizing that Hawaii at the time still wasn't actually a US state. Sure, it was a US territory, but it had only been acquired back in the late 1800s. And I think many of the people on the islands probably wouldn't have considered themselves as solidly American as people in Hawaii would today. Also, remember, this was on the island of Nihau, a much smaller and more isolated island, not like Oahu, where there would have been a much greater American presence. So back to the story. Well, at this time, the island of Nihau had neither electricity nor telephones, but later that night, they heard a radio report about the attack. So pretty soon, the locals knew what had happened, and they confronted Nishikaichi about it. This time around, Harada translated what the pilot said back to them about the attack. The owner of the island of Nihau at the time, a man by the name of Eilmer Robinson, was due to return the following day for a visit. So it was collectively decided that Nishikaichi, the pilot, would return back to the main island with him upon his departure. However, the American military had just instituted a ban, understandably, on boat travel between the islands. So Robinson wasn't able to make his trip out there. So what they decided to do was they would let Nishikaichi stay with the Haradas, the husband and wife, but under guard, so with a contingent of four guards. Unfortunately though, this gave the Haradas and Nishikaichi ample opportunity to talk about anything they wanted to talk about because the Hawaiians couldn't understand Japanese. Now, if you'll remember from the beginning of the story, Shintani, the original Japanese man that the native Hawaiians approached to help translate, he decided now, for some reason, after storming off, that he was actually, in fact, going to help with the situation. He discussed a plan with the Haradas and with Nishikaichi to try and pay Kale Ohano to get the papers back, basically bribe him to get his, his flight papers back. They decided to go ahead with this, and he approached Kale Ohano, who was steadfast. Even though he was offered, I think, $200, which was like almost $4,000 in today's money at the time, which would have been a really big amount for a native Hawaiian on those islands to receive, but he still was having none of it. Which I think, again, is a really interesting uh, part of the story because Kale Ohano was a native Hawaiian who arguably would have more of a reason to be anti-American than any of these local Japanese people or people of Japanese ancestry because the Americans had taken basically his land and all of that stuff. So I think it's really interesting that he was steadfastly loyal where the local Japanese people and people of Japanese descent were immediately not. Shintani, angered at being refused yet again, stormed off in defeat. But before he had even had a chance to return, Harada and the pilot Nishikaichi decided to take the opportunity to attack the guards outside the house. They waited for a moment when three of the guards went away for some reason, and there was only one guard left for them to contend with. While they attacked the guard, Harada's wife Irene played music on a phonograph to cover up the sounds of the struggle. Haruda and Nishikaichi quickly overpowered the guard and they locked him in a warehouse where they were able to find a shotgun and the pistol that had been confiscated from Nishikaichi in the beginning. After locking the guard away, Nishikaichi and Harada turned their attention to the nearby crashed plane. But all the while, Kale Ohano, the original Hawaiian man who'd confiscated the papers and who'd acted so quickly, had seen the entire thing happen and he ran to a nearby village to warn everyone but not before Nishikaichi and Harada saw him running and started taking shots at him. Fortunately, they missed. Initially, the residents of the nearby village were skeptical and didn't want to act when Kale Ohano told them to evacuate. But very quickly after that, the guard who'd been locked in the warehouse escaped, made it to the village, and backed up Kale Ohano's story, causing everyone else to flee into the fields and into nearby caves. 
Now, by this point, Robinson, the owner of Nihao, was aware that something was amiss from the nearby island of Kauai, where he was currently staying, because the locals on Nihao had been flashing him, making a distress signal using a kerosene lantern. Meanwhile, Nishikaichi and Harada made an unsuccessful attempt to contact the Japanese military using the downed plane's radio. At that point, in frustration, they decided to extract one of the plane's guns and some ammo, torch the plane, and proceed to go to Kaleohano's house. Once there, they proceeded to set the poor man's house on fire in an attempt to once and for all destroy the papers that Nishikaichi had on his plane, which apparently included radio codes, maps, and attack plans for the attack on Pearl Harbor. I just have to take a moment to recognize the brazenness of, of these acts. I mean, these guys had just met this down pilot the night before, and they decided just to throw their lot completely in with him without any regard for their local loyalties, the relationships they'd surely built with their neighbors. It's just really mind boggling to me. I mean, when I first heard this story, I was really um, disturbed and very, very unnerved by the fact that they would actually do this, as I'm sure a lot of Americans felt at the time, which I'll get back to in a minute. Desperate, Nishikaichi and Harada decided to capture another local man who went by the nickname of Kalima, and they told him that they would release him if he agreed to pursue Kaleohano and retrieve the papers from him before he had a chance to escape with them. However, also being a badass, instead, immediately upon being released, Kalima decided to enlist the help of his friend Ben Kanahele, another local man. Rather than pursue Kaleohano, they decided to sneak back into the Harada household at night and steal back the machine gun and ammo that they'd taken from the airplane. Unfortunately for them, Nishikaichi and Harada were able to capture Ben Kanahele and his wife. They proceeded to offer Ben the same deal as they had offered Kalima. They would release him and they wouldn't harm his wife if he were to pursue Kaleohano and retrieve the papers and bring them back. Now, by this point, and both Ben and Kalima knew this, Kaleohano was on a boat rowing towards Kauai to spread the word of the incident to Robinson, the owner of the island. So instead of searching for him seriously, Ben just pretended to search for Kaleohano in an attempt to buy time. But after a while, Ben Kanahele became concerned for his wife and returned to check up on her. At this point, Nishikaichi and Harada knew they were being deceived, and Harada took Kanahele aside and told him that Nishikaichi would kill everyone in the village if he didn't go and in fact find Kaleohano and bring him back. Now, as they were being told this, Kanahele and his wife realized that Nishikaichi and Harada were starting to show signs of fatigue. They had been up since the day before, and they had been hatching all of these plans, so clearly they were getting a little bit tired. They waited for the perfect moment to strike, and as Nishikaichi handed the shotgun to Harada, in that moment, both Kanahele and his wife leapt at them. When Nishikaichi reached down to pull his pistol out of his boot, Ella Kanahele, Ben's wife, immediately grabbed his arm and pulled it down. Apparently there were no shortage of badasses in this story. I mean, these locals were just something else, and you really gotta respect that. Harada grabbed Ella Kanahele and pulled her off of Nishikaichi, who at that moment pulled his gun up and shot Ben three times. Once in the groin, once in the stomach, and once in the upper leg. But that was not yet the end of our friend, good old Ben Kanahele, who still had the strength to lift up Nishikaichi and hurl him against a wall. Then Ella picked up a stone and bashed Nishikaichi over the head with it. Finally, Ben came around and slit Nishikaichi's throat, ending him once and for all. Upon seeing this, Harada turned the shotgun on himself and committed suicide. So despite all of those grisly details, the story does have a somewhat happy ending as Ben did not succumb to his wounds and later recovered in the hospital. He received the medal for merit and a purple heart, but unfortunately his wife Ella didn't receive any official recognition for her acts. Finally, the next afternoon, several members of the military and Robinson himself arrived on the island. Shintani, the original Japanese first generation man who assisted in the whole thing, but didn't actually commit some of the more grievous offenses, and Irene Harada were both taken into custody. Shintani was actually interned, 
but eventually, after the war's end, was released and he attained his U.S. citizenship in 1960. Irene Harada, on the other hand, was imprisoned for almost three years, but was later released, and she maintained her innocence in the whole affair for the rest of her life. However, she did admit in an interview in the 1990s that she felt really bad for the pilot, and she wanted to help him. Now, of course, to many Americans, this event was a very shocking one. How quickly these Japanese people and people of Japanese ancestry were willing to go over to this pilot's cause was troubling and disturbing to many people. There's some debate as to how much this act influenced the US government's decision to ultimately intern Japanese, but it certainly didn't help. Still, on top of that, the Hawaiian Islands were largely spared from the internment program, interestingly enough. However, Hawaii did have martial law imposed, and there were lookouts, and things were much more locked down than before as a result. So what can we take from this event? I think, firstly, it's important to realize that there are always spies in war, and there are always people on the ground in the enemy country trying to blend in, doing reconnaissance and getting information. For example, there was a man by the name of Takeo Yoshikawa, who was a Japanese spy who lived on Oahu, who did a lot of the reconnaissance and information gathering to assist the Japanese in their attack on the harbor itself. But the Nihau incident was different. And to be honest, it really got me thinking, as a resident of Japan, as an American living here, I've lived here for 10 years, I pay taxes, I'm married to a Japanese woman, my daughter is half Japanese, what would I do in a similar situation? And, you know, the answer is not as cut and dry as I would like to have thought originally after hearing this and being so shocked by this incident. I mean, if America attacked Japan and an American pilot was downed near where I live, would I help that pilot, you know? Um, I suppose it would really depend on the nature of the attack. Why was America attacking Japan? Which side did I believe was right? Um, you know, I, I don't know, there's, there's a lot to think about there. But if I'm being completely honest with myself, I'm not sure what I would do. Because I do have a lot of loyalty to my home country. Now, I'm not second, third generation like Harada was in this situation. But Irene and Shintani were first generation immigrants. So they're kind of like me. They would feel possibly similarly. If I wasn't briefed beforehand, if I wasn't given time to make a decision and suddenly I was presented with this dilemma, what decision would I make? It's really important to think about. And I think uh, it's important for all of us to think about. The second important thing I think is to put ourselves in the shoes of Americans at the time. Although the vast majority of Japanese Americans were loyal and in no way did they feel divided in their loyalties, in no way were they inclined to support the Japanese or betray the United States, that didn't really matter to a lot of Americans upon hearing about incidents like this. They probably would have reacted with fear and based on gut and instinct. And I think a lot of people would have done the same thing. So it's hard to judge people too harshly, those that supported the internment of Japanese citizens at the time, because a lot of them were just scared. We also have to remember that this incident happened at the onset of the war. It was within literally the first couple of hours of the war against the Japanese. And if Japanese Americans were willing to switch sides that early on in the conflict with that little hesitation, I mean, can you really blame people for being afraid? And finally, although I said earlier, I am in no way trying to condemn Japanese Americans or in no way am I trying to paint them all with the same brush. That's not the point of this video. But I think it is important to look at the circumstances of this event and to recognize that the native Hawaiians stayed more loyal by far. They were the real heroes of this story than the local Japanese Americans were. Although this event was the exception rather than the rule, I really don't think we should ignore it. I think we need to think about this and, and look inward and think about what we would do in their situation, but also to recognize were we Americans in support of internment at the time, why would we feel that that was justified? All just things to think about. Well, anyways, that's it for this video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're interested in this sort of content, lately I've been kind of on a 
on a stories and historical events and incidents type of kick. I've also been doing a lot on World War II. My last video was on World War II as well. That's just by coincidence, because I happened to visit Hawaii recently. But if you're interested in this sort of thing or other videos about the outdoors or Japanese history and culture, please consider liking and subscribing. Also, if you have anything to add to the conversation, please continue it down in the comments section, as well as any suggestions or ideas you have for future videos. I'm always open ears. Anyways, take care and Happy New Year, everyone.